nothing you experience is as real as it seems to be. To fully appreciate this, be sure to watch the guided meditation at the end of this video. There's an enormous gap between appearance and reality, between how you perceive things and what those things really are. For example, the sky looks blue, but air is colorless, and outer space is black. The video you're watching right now is actually a series of still images projected on a screen 30 images per second. And when you watch the sunset, the sun doesn't really travel downwards. The horizon moves up as the earth turns on its axis. All these examples show something you already know quite well. Appearances can be deceiving. It's natural to believe that your five senses of sight, hearing, taste, smell, and touch give you an accurate representation of the world around you. But the fact is, your powers of perception are extremely limited. Experiencing the world through your five senses is like looking through five little pinholes pierced in a heavy blanket covering your head. Science has shown that you can only perceive a minute fraction of what really exists. For example, a dog can sniff and differentiate 50 times more smells than you can. Your ears can hear only a narrow range of pitches and your eyes can only see colors from red to violet. But beyond those pitches and colors lies a vast range of sound and light that you simply can't perceive. The point is, because the range of your senses is so limited, you can't fully and accurately perceive the world around you. Only a tiny part is accessible. And there's another problem. Everything you see, hear, taste, smell, and touch is conveyed to your brain by your nervous system. Then, your powerful brain produces a mental representation or model of the world. That mental representation of the world is what you directly perceive, not the world outside. To understand this better, consider the fact that each of your eyes sees a flat, two-dimensional image of whatever you're looking at, like two photographs taken by a camera. Your brain combines those flat images into a three-dimensional view, a view that has depth and distance. Look around you. The three-dimensional image of the room you're in is actually a mental representation of the room. You're only indirectly aware of the room because your experience is mediated by your brain and senses. Now, before we continue, it's really important to ask just how accurate is the mental representation of the world produced by your brain and senses? Does it differ in any way from the world around you? Researchers in psychology and neuroscience have shown that your mental model of the world is based partly on what your senses perceive and partly on additional information supplied by your brain. Your brain modifies and enhances whatever your senses perceive. For example, each of your eyes has a blind spot where the optic nerve meets the retina. Any part of an image that falls on those blind spots is lost. Yet, images in your mind are complete and free from gaps because your brain fills in any parts that are missing. Your brain also transforms the series of still images you're watching right now into a continuously moving picture. 
Yet, even though your brain usually enhances what your senses perceive, it sometimes makes mistakes. That's why these lines look crooked. And that's why the sun seems to go down at sunset. So you have to ask, is the world in your mind an accurate and trustworthy representation of the world around you? You have to admit that the world you experience is an incomplete and sometimes defective version of the world around you. This conclusion is amazing, and it has far-reaching consequences. Because the world you experience is conceived in your mind, it's similar in many ways to your experience when you're dreaming. When you dream, you create a world in your mind. Your dream world is based on memories and imagination, whereas your experience of the world around you is based on sense perception. Yet, both the waking and the dream worlds similarly exist in your mind. Your experiences of waking and dreaming are not so different. Sometimes your dreams are so vivid that they seem utterly real. And when you're awake, in the midst of a terrible tragedy, you might feel like you're having a bad dream. You can appreciate the similarity better if you imagine that you suddenly lost the use of your senses. Suppose you were blind, deaf, and totally numb from head to toe. What would you experience? Well, you'd still experience a world in your mind, a world based on your memories alone. Now, in that strange condition, would you know whether you were awake or dreaming? How could you tell the difference? In the absence of sense perception, it's impossible to distinguish being awake from dreaming. The waking world and dream world both arise in your mind. Every day they come and go. When you wake up, your dream world disappears. And when you fall asleep, the waking world disappears. In all these ways, your experience of the world around you resembles a dream. This comparison is made in many important texts on Advaita Vedanta. Okay, now that we've examined the world in your mind, let's shift our perspective and examine the outer world, the physical world. First of all, it's really important to understand that nothing we've discussed so far suggests that the physical world is really just a dream. Advaita Vedanta says the world is like a dream. It doesn't say the world is a dream. The world is compared to a dream to show that it isn't as real as it seems to be. According to Advaita Vedanta, the physical world does indeed exist, but it's not absolutely real. The world is said to be merely nama and rupa, name and form. Let me explain. This object is called pot. Its name is arbitrary. It's called matka in Hindi and gata in Sanskrit. The word pot is not a thing, it's just a name for a thing. Similarly, the form of this object is arbitrary. It could be large or small, tall or wide. And like its name is not a thing, its form, too, is not a thing. Form is the size and shape of a thing. This thing is actually clay. It's clay in the form of a pot. Now, 
there's some confusion due to language here. When you call it a clay pot, according to grammar, pot is the noun, the thing, and clay is an adjective that describes it. But that's deceptive because clay is really the thing, not pot. Pot merely describes the clay, like an adjective. Strictly speaking, this isn't a clay pot; it's clay in the form of pot. Maybe we should call it potty clay. In the language of Advaita Vedanta, this pot is merely nama rupa, name and form, whereas clay is the actual thing. Clay is the substance, the underlying reality, because of which this pot exists. Next, consider this: clay existed before this pot was made, and will continue to exist if the pot gets broken. This pot can come and go; it's transient, ephemeral. Clay, on the other hand, doesn't come and go. Clay exists. Independently of the pot, but this pot depends entirely on clay for its existence. Based on this, we can say that clay is more substantial; it's more real than the pot. But that doesn't mean this pot is unreal. The tiny elephant standing on my hand is unreal, but this pot. Isn't like the elephant; it exists. It's just less real than clay. In Sanskrit, the word mitya is used to describe the reality of this pot. Mitya describes things that are apparently real, things that exist as nama rupa, names and forms, things that exist depending on an. Underlying substance or reality. Advaita Vedanta uses the same language in describing the world. The world around you is nama rupa, name and form, like the pot, and like this pot depends on an underlying substance for its existence. The world depends on an underlying reality for its existence. That underlying fundamental reality can be understood as pure existence, existence itself. The ancient rishis called it Brahman. The world is mitya, apparently real, whereas Brahman is satyam, absolutely real. Brahman exists independently of the world, like clay. Exists independently of a pot. Now, what's the point of all these philosophical observations? Well, just like the representation of the world inside your mind is not absolutely real, the same is true for the world around you. The physical world is merely nama rupa, name and form. Like this pot is not as real as clay, the world is not as real as Brahman. Even from a scientific perspective, the world isn't as real as it seems to be. Consider this table; it seems to be solid, solid wood. Yet, wood is made of tiny atoms. Each atom, you might remember, has a positively charged nucleus with negatively charged electrons spinning around it. There's a lot of empty space between the nucleus and the electron, so the atoms in this wood are more than 99.999 percent empty space. This table isn't as solid as it seems. It's mostly empty space, but then, why does it seem so solid? Well, my hand is also made of atoms. 
and the negatively charged electrons in the atoms of my hand are strongly repelled by the negatively charged electrons in the atoms of this wood. So my hand is actually repelled by the table, and neither my hand nor the table is truly solid. How strange is that? This is one more example of how perception can deceive you. This wood seems solid, just like the sky seems blue and the sun seems to go down each evening. To understand what the world really is, you can't blindly accept everything you see, hear, taste, smell, and touch. Your ordinary experiences make the world seem much more real than it truly is. Then, how can you break free from this illusion? How can you see the world exactly as it is? That's what we'll discuss next. Many years ago, I lived in California, and I grew accustomed to the little earthquakes that would shake the ground from time to time. One of those earthquakes was large enough to knock books off their shelves and cause some minor damage. During that earthquake, I happened to look outside through a window, and I saw the ground heaving up and down in giant waves, like huge swells rolling across the ocean. After the shaking stopped, I stepped outside, and to my surprise, I actually felt afraid to walk on the ground. I feared that it wouldn't hold my weight, or that it would slip out from beneath me somehow. Like most people, I had always believed that the ground we walk on is solid and perfectly stable. But the fact is, the surface of the earth is a thin, rocky crust that's broken up into vast sections called plates. And those plates float on the molten core of the earth, like icebergs floating in the ocean. Those plates drift around and bump into each other, causing earthquakes. So, I was wrong to think that the ground is solid and perfectly stable. My entire life, I had accepted that false notion. I embraced an illusion, an illusion of solidity and stability. I never questioned that notion because every time I walked around, the ground seemed solid and stable. But the earthquake taught me a lesson. That experience completely destroyed the illusion I held. The point of this anecdote is to show how a false belief or illusion can be removed by an experience. In particular, by an experience that leads you to discover the falsity of the illusion. In this way, the false belief or illusion that the world around you is absolutely real could also be removed by an experience of some sort. What kind of experience? Well, some people say that psychedelic drugs like LSD have the power to produce such an experience. According to some ex-hippies and unconventional researchers, those drugs can produce a state of consciousness in which you experience a deeper level of reality. And that experience can destroy the illusion that the world is absolutely real. In the 1960s, I was a reckless teenager who also experimented with LSD. I experienced some vivid hallucinations and bizarre thoughts. I saw a blank wall begin to undulate and change colors like a kaleidoscope. Those experiences led me to understand that 
My brain produced a model or mental representation of the world that could be badly distorted by LSD. Yet I fail to experience a deeper level of reality, as some people do. In retrospect, those experiments were extremely foolish and could have harmed me. Many years later, after I began to practice meditation regularly, I learned that my drug use had been completely unnecessary. You can use certain kinds of meditation to strip away the veil of illusion that makes the world around you seem absolutely real. First of all, meditation turns your attention inwards and helps you gain a better understanding of how your mind works. In this way, you can more clearly recognize the model of the world that's continually constructed in your mind, and you can become increasingly aware of the model's limitations and defects. To recognize this, it's best to practice meditation techniques that lead you to watch the activities of your mind as a detached witness or objective observer. You can find a detailed explanation of those practices in my videos on the inner journey, a course in meditation. Eventually, those practices can change the way you relate to the world. Instead of falsely believing that you directly experience the world, you'll always be aware of the fact that you're really experiencing a model of the world in your mind. For advanced practitioners, there's another way that meditation can help you realize that the world is not absolutely real. Deep meditation can lead you to reach samadhi, a state of total absorption. In samadhi, no divisions of any kind remain. No division between observer and observed no division between experiencer and experienced. In the state of samadhi, all that remains is you. You and your fundamental, essential nature as pure existence, as Brahman. Then, with the help of Vedantic teachings, you can personally discover Brahman to be the underlying reality because of which everything exists. Direct knowledge of Brahman can radically transform your worldview. How? Like knowing clay makes you realize that pot is merely nama rupa. In the same way, knowing Brahman makes you realize that the entire world is merely nama rupa. There's one more way that meditation can help strip away the illusion that the world is absolutely real. If you've accepted this illusion your entire life, it's deeply embedded in your thinking, and it's become central to your worldview. How can you remove such a firmly rooted false notion? Certainly, watching this video isn't going to be enough. To remove that habitual wrong notion, Advaita Vedanta prescribes a particular kind of meditation, a technique known as Nididhyasana. Nididhyasana is unlike most meditation techniques that make your mind silent or create a special state of mind. Rather, Nididhyasana is meant to help you contemplate and fully assimilate profound spiritual truths, truths that you've previously discovered. That process of assimilation can completely transform your worldview. To understand how it works, 
Suppose I sat next to you in a movie theater while you watched a really powerful dramatic film. Like most people, you'd probably get deeply immersed in the plot, and you might even forget that you're watching a movie. Then, instead of seeing talented actors on a Hollywood stage, the scenes would look quite real to you. Suppose I were to tap you on the shoulder and whisper, "Remember, it's only a movie." That would immediately break your immersion in the movie. You might even feel like you popped out of the movie, so to speak. But after a while, you'd probably get immersed in the plot again. So suppose I were to tap you on the shoulder once every minute to remind you that it's just a movie. That repetition would ensure that you never again get immersed in the plot and consider the scenes to be real. Now, just like you can pop out of a movie. You can pop out of the illusion that the world is absolutely real. The moment you recognize the world to be merely nama rupa, the illusion of reality gets shattered, and you get an insight into the nature of Brahman. Profound insights like this can be extremely powerful, but they often fade away. And after a while, the world seems absolutely real again. Those insights fade away because the illusion of the world's reality has been so deeply embedded in your thinking. To break free from that habitual wrong notion, the practice of nididhyasna is essential. Nididhyasna makes use of repetition to completely overcome habitual wrong notions by repeatedly reflecting on or contemplating the teachings we've discussed here. Wrong notions can gradually be weakened and eventually eliminated altogether. To show you how nididhyasna works, we'll conclude this video with a brief guided meditation. We'll draw upon the teachings of Shankaracharya, the great master of Advaita Vedanta. Shankara was famous for expressing an important, fundamental truth in just half a verse. He said, "Brahma satyam." Jagan mitya, Brahman is satyam, pure existence, absolutely real. Jagat, the world, is mitya, apparent, mere names and forms. In this practice, you can close your eyes and mentally recite those words as I recite them out loud, while chanting Brahma satyam. You can reflect on Brahman being the underlying reality because of which the world exists, and while chanting Jagan Mitya, you can reflect on the fact that the world you experience directly is just a mental representation of the world, and the world around you that you experience indirectly is merely Nama Rupa. To get ready for this practice, please close your eyes. Take a deep breath. Hold for a moment, and then exhale slowly. Again, take a deep breath. Hold, and exhale slowly. One more time, deep breath, hold, exhale slowly.
Chant mentally as I chant aloud and allow yourself to reflect on or contemplate all that we've discussed here. Brahma Satyam Jagan Brahma Satyam Jagan Hitya 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 Brahma Satyam 
Sakyam Chagam Hithya Brahma Satyam Chagam Satyam Chagam Hithyam Brahma Satyam Chagam Brahma Satyam Chagam Hithya 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 Oh.